Imagine this. Your favorite TV show or movie series ended eight years ago without ever finishing the story. It's been slated to return every year since. However, there's little talk from the producers or studio. And suddenly, the producers announce the show will not only return for another season, but will air alongside a new spin-off series. Then the release date rolls around, and the original series starts again. It's okay, definitely a little different than you remember, having almost been a decade since the last season. However, this new spin-off series immediately garners massive attention for being innovative and unique. Enough for people to sign up for a new streaming service just to see it. This is how Metroid Prime came to be. At least, if you replace the original TV show with the 2D Metroid games and the spin-off with Metroid Prime. Metroid Prime managed to capture the hearts of people worldwide because of its ability to keep the same explorative, open-ended story and gameplay from its 2D siblings, as well as managing to give the players a sense of progression and achievement as they played all while creating an amazing, atmospheric experience by building a cohesive world full of diverse ecosystems, all with their own themes, making a game worthy to be called a masterpiece. An interesting point in Prime's development was who made it. As mentioned earlier, the Metroid series as a whole had been dormant for about eight years. But in 2002, a new studio was entrusted to release a new type of Metroid game. The studio went by the name Retro Studios, and had, at the time, not so much as released a game, making them quite the gamble to create a new one. However, the gamble paid off when they released Metroid Prime alongside Metroid Fusion. Metroid Prime was a smash hit. Before launch, it had players excited, but skeptical. They had no clue how a completely different take on the series would be. After launch, it was praised for its innovation and ability to remain true to the source material. Metroid Prime's first amazing element is the story. The game starts the player on a broken spaceship after the game's pivotal, steely protagonist, Samus Aran, receives a distress signal from it. The ship is filled with hurt space pirates, as it is revealed they are the ones who sent the distress signal. Samus encounters her rival, the space pirate Ridley, who she then follows onto the planet known as Talon IV. Throughout the game, Samus discovers a highly volatile element known as Phazon which the space pirates were using as a mutagen to modify living creatures. In the end, Samus encounters a Metroid that absorbs large amounts of Phazon and is now the game's namesake, THE Metroid Prime. Of course, there's no way to talk about a video game without talking about how it plays. For someone who's more used to the current era of first-person shooter games, it might feel a bit strange, as all the movement, including looking around, is mapped to the left joystick, meaning there's no strafing left and right though the controls are very reminiscent of classic console shooter games, where the player must hold down a button to aim around the screen. The game remedies this with the stellar lock-on system. This allows the player to lock on to an enemy and move relative to it. The player can now move sideways, and with the press of the B button, can dodge quickly out of the way of attacks. This system makes it a lot easier to target enemies and makes combat much more manageable. The actual gameplay is a lot of exploration and, of course, backtracking. When starting the game, the player is put in a linear area known as the frigate ship Orpheon. This acts as a tutorial, showing the player the controls and abilities they will be using throughout the game. However, once the short area is complete, the player is introduced to the lush green overworld of Talon IV, at which point the game shows its true, far more open-ended nature. After that, it is left to the player to figure out where they must go next and what they need to do. They will have to explore. Throughout the world, there are different areas and ideas that will need to be remembered for later when the player is given the ability to use them, such as various halfpipes strewn across the world, only to be used after getting a morph ball upgrade. The game, being a Metroid game, is heavily focused on platforming elements, which have been very well translated into a first-person experience. Past Metroid games were never focused heavily on combat, seeing as they were fairly limited by the 2D perspective. In contrast, Metroid Prime is able to create exciting situations for battles due to the first-person perspective, such as the first boss, where the player must use everything they've learned in combination with puzzle-solving skills to understand how to beat it, with the 3D elements allowing for movement in all directions around the boss, as opposed to a single plane. Yet, even despite the changes, Prime has still got the same map-expanding, upgrade-collecting gameplay that you'd expect from a Metroid title, the game theorist. It manages to remain true to the 2D series with the same feelings and small lay motifs that occur throughout the game, especially in area themes where they are used to create atmosphere. As much as everything else matters, the atmosphere Metroid Prime creates is a huge contributor to what makes the game amazing. As soon as the player even lands on the verdant overworld of Talon IV, it's present. It's created by everything from the music to the tiny details such as little raindrops that land on Samus's visor in the overworld. 
Throughout the player's journey, small details like this crop up, such as certain enemies that give off electrical interference with Samus's visor, or ones that are only able to be seen with a specific visor. But by far, the biggest things that create atmosphere are the area variety, and each area's theme. The game possesses many instances of awe and wonder. When you leave one area only to arrive somewhere that looks completely different only seconds later, the completionist. This sentiment is what gives Metroid Prime so much value. Every area feels completely new and wildly different from the last, almost as if Retro Studios made them specifically to be opposites. No opposites are more apparent than the transition from the superheated, lava-filled Magmore Caverns to the ice-chilled, frozen wastes of the Fendrana Drifts. Of course, each point has its own theme that perfectly encapsulates the feeling for the area. For instance, Magmore Cavern's music gives off feelings of being somewhere extremely hot and humid. Take a listen. Of course, there's its counterpoint, the mysterious and airy almost contemplative theme for the drifts as well. These are the biggest ways Metroid Prime is able to completely immerse the player into the world Samus explores and allowed for this game to be considered among the best. Its areas are completely different. It's even able to create intense situations when Samus might be in trouble, such as a surprise boss fight playing tense music to allow the feeling to set in more easily. All of this contributes to why Metroid Prime can be considered the best in class when it comes to adventure games, and even just video games in general. Metroid Prime managed to gather a huge following and became the best-selling Metroid game, a title which it held until the series' most recent release, Metroid Dread. It was able to define a generation and gave people a reason to buy the console it ran on. It was an amazingly atmospheric experience while innovating on gameplay and still keeping the feel of a Metroid game. Was the game worth the eight-year-long wait that can be called Metroid's first big silence? Absolutely. The game spawned a full trilogy and has a fourth game in development now, Though the Metroid series would have another great silence a few years later, fans of the series would always endure the wait in anticipation for Samus Aran's next great outing. <laughs>